This is a Flip a Junkie podcast, episode 80. Welcome to the Flipping Junkie podcast, the podcast for flip pilots everywhere. Flip pilots are the house flippers that work more on our business instead of in our business by keeping a 30,000 foot view. You're now part of this small group of house flippers that considers themselves flip pilots, that strive to build a life of financial freedom and time freedom so that we can spend more time doing what we love with who we love. In this podcast, I give you a glimpse of the daily life of a flip pilot. So let's get started. Back to the Flippy Junkie podcast today. We've got an excellent episode. We're going to cover wholesaling with Cody Hoffine. And and, uh, just a few years ago, Cody was selling insurance and didn't know much about real estate at all. And he had heard about a niche known as wholesaling, got interested, and he quickly decided to go all in uh, with wholesaling and generated over $500,000 in his first year, which is incredible, and has since created seven-figure wholesaling business. And so we're going to talk to him and find out how he ramped up so quickly and has done so well with it. So this is going to be an exciting episode, and thanks for joining us. All right, welcome back to Flippy Junkie Podcast. I've got Cody here. Hey, thanks for joining me on the show, Cody. Absolutely, glad to be here. And how do you pronounce your last name? Because I said it earlier, but I'm not sure if I said it correctly. I want to make sure I'm not saying it incorrectly throughout the show. <laughs> yeah, it's Hoffine. In fact, I was on uh, John Lee Dumas's podcast, and he, I end up saying like, uh, like Hoffleen or something. I was like, no, like that's close. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think yeah, so- it's Hoffine. So I said it correctly then. Yep. I think. Absolutely. All right. Let me get the volume up a little bit. Okay. So. You have an incredible story. You started wholesaling, and then with that first year, how much did you did you generate in, in revenue and profit? So to go to the quick picture, in the first year, I did just a little over uh, 500K. Nice. That was just done through wholesaling. Nice. And uh, so today, I promised everybody that you would share how you did that, and I'm very interested to see, and especially, you know, to find out, uh, if you started with with some war like a war chest or something of or funds to use to to ramp up marketing quickly, or sort of that help process. So, do you mind sharing all that with us? Love to do so. In fact, that is I think that's the best part about your podcast is deep diving, getting granular, and helping people really get a, a chance out there to go do a wholesale deal. Awesome. So let's just get right into it. So you want to start with how you found out about house flipping and got into it, and what made you decide to go ahead and just jump in. Yeah, yeah. The backstory behind that that's kind of crazy is I was in insurance and I started insurance in 2010. And I was going through that and man, I was busting my tail off. I was going like 80 hours a week thinking all you got to do is just take massive action. You're going to be fine. Things are going to go well. You're going to make a lot of money. And uh, the first year I ended up making $19,000. It was awful. (laughs) It was not just time away from the family and, and being awful, but it was come home with next to nothing and explain to your wife, like, man, this was a a miserable failure. And so, uh, from there, uh, the next year got a little better, but when I say little, I really mean little. The second year I made 27,000. So it's still awful. And, uh, one thing that I seriously, I, I, I thank the heavens that I did is, is I went to a real estate investor association meeting and I started just talking to investors there because I really thought, man, this would be like my avatar. If I could insure them, they got rentals, they've got multiple homes, they got cars, they've got everything. And so really I went there for selfish purposes. It had nothing to do with real estate. And as I started meeting with them and talking with them and insuring some of them, they'd pass me around. They would share numbers with me that maybe they don't share with everyone, but I was just their insurance agent. I was just the geek behind the yeah. desk that wrote a policy. And so they would share, oh, yeah, I just did this one and I made $40,000. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, you just bought that like last week. And right. like, yeah, I know. It's so cool. I'm like, man, you're so <laughs> disgusting. Like I didn't make that my whole life last year. Like right. a piece of crap. <laughs> and so anyways, we, uh, we got into it and I started talking more about uh, what is it they're doing. And uh, some of them were doing like the full on rehab fix and flip. But there was a handful of people that were doing like just the wholesaling that were just that flipping the contracts and, and making money. And so that in, that absolutely intrigued me. And so because of that, I went to uh, – and I still remember it being so hard. This guy was doing a little seminar here in Utah. It was 150 bucks. I'm like, man, that's 150 bucks. Like I don't know if I can do this. 
And uh, I ended up squeaking through and getting uh, 150 bucks out to, to go to it. And it was from there, it just started getting my mind going. Like, I've got to either jump in or right. or jump out, but I, I just got to go do something. So from there, I, I took on what everyone kept telling me, and that was get a mentor. Don't do this by yourself. Don't blaze your own trails. Get a mentor and just – go for it like hardcore and, 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 and just go be successful. And so that's what I did is if from there it was listen to every podcast across the nation and find out who is going to be my mentor and uh, made that choice. And from there, I've never looked back. And that was May of 2015 when I actually started wholesaling. So I went a lot of years just watching this thinking, oh man, it's too good to be true. Yeah. And if someone like Cody's hearing about this, it's too late. But then finally, I just got the courage to jump in. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and it's good because you... I guess like knowing and talking to the people that you were insuring and seeing that they were doing it and seeing that it was possible. And I'm sure a lot of the guys, I myself included, didn't seem super bright or super smart or special, right? You know, just the fact that, you know, just regular people can get into this and actually do it with the right motivation and and uh, being persistent and wanting it bad enough. So how did you, uh, once you decided to get started, you were learning as much as you can how did you start getting those first deals? What were you doing to try to start? Because I guess you, you knew you wanted to just wholesale, right? Or focus on that? Correct. Correct. Yes. I just kind of wanted the, the the quickest way to revenue. And in my mind, that literally was the path to me. I just looked at wholesale and I'm like, man, this resonates. This looked like it will be the quickest path to get revenue in and then uh, hopefully start being able to buy rentals and get passive. But yeah, that's I, I ultimately I just – Grab the, the the horns by I mean the bull by the horns and just and took it for a ride. But uh, breaking it down granular, what I did and what that looks like, it's uh, it was starting with the end in mind. I can tell you that much right now. So a lot of people still to this day will come up to me and say, "Hey Cody, how do I find my first deal?" And I I I tell them exactly what my mentor taught me. And that is you've got to get that cash buyers list. You've got to build that up and get that in place because it doesn't matter how hot the deal is or how great the deal is that you find. If you don't have an end game in mind, like it doesn't matter. You can't do nothing with it. And so uh, every maybe new listener out there that might be listening to this, it's go find your, your, your cash buyers. And they're a dime a dozen. They're in every market. It's not hard. It's very simple. Um, I don't know if you want me to give you a simple granular approach on how you can do that, but there's so many ways no, you can do that. we don't want to know how to do that. We don't okay, want to know. Don't perfect. share it. Nobody wants to hear all that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> of course, man. Share it. Share it all. Share, share how you did that. Okay, I'd love so to hear it. With uh, with cash buyers, there's a couple ways you could do it, obviously. I mean, you go just to, to your typical real estate investor association meetings, and they're all in there. They're all sitting in there looking for hungry wholesalers that can go out and find deals for them. Um, a lot of people think, why don't they find their own deals? I'm telling you, it's a completely yeah. different beast. It's a completely different model. They are happy to pay you money to go find them their next deal. Absolutely. As long as it's a win-win, they're fine to pay whatever that cost is. Right. Uh, but you can go to a real estate meeting, just let them know, hey, I am a local wholesaler or a local investor. I find deeply discounted properties. Can I let you know about them? And they say, yes, here's my information. They're very aware of what you're doing. Um, the other way you can do it is simple. And I, I teach this uh, a lot to people is, Get on the phone like on Craigslist. In Utah, it's KSL.com. Craigslist is hardly ever used in Utah. But for national-wise, Craigslist is kind of a big site. It's probably a, a universal site that I feel safe saying this. But you'll call that list and just call up landlords. Call people that are trying to uh, rent their properties. Mm, nice. And there's two approaches you can do with this that make it super nice. As you're, as they're, I mean, obviously, they're looking for a renter. It's vacant at the time. So first and foremost, if you caught a, uh, a landlord that's just tired and worn oh, out and being <laughs> try to buy the sick house. of being yeah. a landlord. Yeah, so I'll start out first of all like that. Like, hey, I'm looking at your house on 123 Main Street. Is that still available? Yeah, it's still available. Are you interested? Well, I, it's kind of a crazy question. I'm looking to buy a couple homes in this neighborhood. Are you happen to, uh, would you be willing to sell this home? And if they say yes, great, let's have that conversation. But in the way of how to turn that conversation into a cash buyer, when they say no, then you can say, well, tell me this. Are you interested in acquiring more properties at a deep discount, like 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar so that you can build your rental portfolio? And I wouldn't say nine times out of 10, but it's a high majority. I mean, I definitely say seven times out of 10. They're like, yes, like, tell me more. Well, I come across these all the time. I market statewide. And so I come across any area. Is there any specific area, Mr. Mr. Landlord, that you're looking for? Well, man, if you can keep it right there in West Valley, right next to my rental, 
and I just write notes down mm -hmm. and now I just added a cash buyer. And so you can do, you can pound out, I mean, sky's the limit, 20, 30, 40, 50 phone calls a day to get 70% of these people to say, yes, like, let me know when you have these deals that are 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. And then, you know, the fact that they're landlords, a lot of times they will pay more for a property than another investor will to fix and flip. So spot on. So right, spot so. on. That's so true. Yeah, that's nice. So I like that approach a lot. And uh, I thought you were just going to say post ads saying that you've got deals. So it's good that you're thinking that other approach of find the guys that already have property. So you know that they have done something. They've bought more than their own home and, uh, you know, or more likely to have the ability to buy your properties from you. So that's pretty cool. I like that. All right. So so what else you got? You got, you know, uh, networking at RIA's. You've got Craigslist. Any other ways to quickly build that buyer's list up? Yeah, one way I, I, I have used, and this is going to be, I mean, it can be hit and miss in every market, but it has worked well for me. There's a lot of cash deals that get purchased in, in Salt Lake territory. And so I'll literally just get with the realtor and just say, hey, can you run like all the recent cash deals that have happened in such and such area or such and such county? And they'll run all the cash deals. And what I'll do is then take those addresses and see whose names are on title and then I'll send them a mailer. And so that way you can direct mail people that are buying homes cash, and that one's huge. I think that's an easy way to tap into, because you're seeing it. You saw the transaction that it was purchased cashed, and you're able to see and know instantly, like, hey, that guy has cash, let's see if he wants more. Right, and recently he was looking for properties, so yeah, that's awesome. I Correct. Like that. And then you see what they paid Correct. for it. <laughs> you have a good that's idea exactly of what they're right. likely to pay for those properties. That's exactly right. Now you can really look at the market and say, man, he was willing to pay 75000 I got this home for 50000 That means I can make 25000 if I sell it to him. Right, so, right. yeah, so, absolutely. So how exactly are you reaching out to them? What do you find is best to reach out to them? And, um, you know, how are you finding their addresses as well? Yeah, so with that, I'll look them up and do like a, a, just on county, right? So I'll type in the address that sold. And then I'll look at the on the county assessor's website, type it in, you'll find who owns it, and usually there'll be a mailing address attached to it. And we just send a simple postcard that says, hey, we've been trying to get a hold of you. Uh, we just wanna know if you want to uh, buy smoking hot deals, like 50, 60 cents on the dollar. And uh, you, it's not an awesome, I mean, like I said, it's not the highest response rate. Obviously the best approach is get people on the phone instantly. Right. So if you have access to phone numbers, you can run skip tracing or whatever you wanna do, but uh, we definitely hit them with the, with the direct mail and just continually hit them up so that they see, oh man, this, I mean, sometimes I'll have a cash buy that says, yeah, I received your uh, cash or your, your postcard eight times and I'm, I, I just wanna check it out and see what you guys are doing. He ends up buying like three homes from me. And nice. so there is there is wisdom in follow-up, follow-up. Some people just like instantly just rip up postcards, but this gentleman finally on the eighth time yeah. uh, read the message and he's like, man, maybe this guy really does have something. Yeah, it's awesome. So it's a, it's a good point to be consistent even with the mailings and persistent with the mailings to find buyers, not just one off and nobody contacted me, maybe they don't wanna buy keep hitting them because they like you said then then you're in their head they they remember you they've seen you enough and it's like wow this guy keeps mailing me they're thinking more about it instead of just chunking it in the trash and uh, so so the age-old question uh for for a buyer's list do you like a bigger buyer's list or a better buyer's list like a focus I, like on a smaller like vip type thing i love big like i want that baby busting at the seams i want i want 600 names on there i mean or more i mean sky's the limit because yeah. what you can do is then when you start sending out these deals you start sending out the option to buy these homes um with that being said it, i mean if you can get 20 people to go inspect this home at the same time you can get a, a fun little feeding frenzy oh, there right. that we're right now in this market and this market is so strong, so good and so much more reason why your listeners should definitely get active and start uh, yeah. taking massive action because you'll send out a deal at 95,000 and I'll send 20 people go up there and they bid it up to 115,000. You're like, holy smokes. And, and, and I'm telling you now is the market. But even if the market was a recession or a depression, wholesaling is still going to be around. You're just following the trend of what the home's worth and what you can pay for it. And so it's still going to always be around. Right. But right now it's just super unique. There's there's cash buyers that are bidding these babies up, which is super nice for for the wholesaler. Right. And and you know how the market's always a cycle, right? It's either harder to buy, easier to sell, or easier to buy, you know, relatively, of course, harder to sell. And so right now we're at a point where it's 
it's harder to find the good deals because there's so many investors, which means you should be wholesaling because people are going to pay top dollar for every single deal. So if you become an expert at finding the deals because it's harder, that's where you make all the money. And so that's why wholesaling makes so much sense right now. Now, whenever you send out your wholesale deal to your list, are you saying the price that you want for that or are you saying or best offer or do you do anything like that that kind of gets them bidding more for the property? Yeah, a simple message that I do, because remember, we're not marketing, obviously, the property, but marketing that contract, that assignable contract. And so I simply just say, like, hey, this is a assignable contract that allows you to purchase the home on 123 Main Street. And then in the message, I'll just say suggested price, 185 Oh, nice. Suggested price. I'm going to have to write that down. Yeah, it's it's key. It's a, it's a, it's a key, key uh, spot on, because then it's not... Uh, asking price 185 and all of a sudden someone calls you up and says i've got 185 like where do i need to go tell me where i need to go and it's like well uh we got to hold on uh well no cody you said 185 i'm giving you 185 and so now i don't have to deal with that it's more of suggested price 25 hey cody it's 25 well guess what i've got 10 people super interested at this point so right now since you gave me a full offer and multiple people are interested i'm gonna ask you like give me your highest and best and i'll get back to you by four o'clock today yeah i like that so do you find how, how many how often do you find that that to be the case where there's multiple people like that, you know, rough idea percentage of the deals that you guys put out right now in this market, every deal has multiple, multiple oh, nice. uh, people out there uh, just because it is. It's like you said, I mean, you, you nailed it spot on. It, it's it's getting harder and harder to find the deal. So if you can be good at it, mm -hmm. uh, we'll do anywhere from about seven to ten deals a month. And with that, we will literally every one of our deals i i've i it's been months since i've only seen one buyer interested i mean it's it's always wow, three nice. four five sometimes 10 sometimes 15 that uh that come out to that property and inspect it wow this is all in salt lake huh the, yeah so i'm in five major counties now in uh utah but i started just right here in my stomping grounds right here in salt lake and then when i had the capacity to expand i just i saw the opportunity and uh, now I have all the surrounding counties as well. Oh, nice. So do you, so are some of those smaller towns that you focus on? Is that, it's still pretty big, bigger, bigger metros? Yeah, they're, they're still pretty big cities. I wouldn't say there's anything out in the sticks or out okay. in the, out in the nowhere. It's all connected. I mean, all of them are literally all connected off of the freeway from all from Salt Lake. So they're all counties that are all connected to each other. Okay, cool. And, uh, okay. So the biggest rebuttal I think that I hear from people when you talk about wholesaling is um you know, like well the you know with wholesaling you've got to find a lot of deals and to me that's the hardest part i'm finding it hard to find deals to fix and flip and if i'm going to wholesale i've got to find even more and so i don't want to do that because i it's so hard to find the deals and you've got to buy them even cheaper because you're selling them to other investors you know what do you say to that that's a good question. I just had a lunch with a, a gentleman that's a cash buyer of mine and a, and a, a hard cash lender. And so I sit down with him at lunch and he says, Cody, I don't understand. Why don't you keep these deals and fix and flip them yourself? Like I, I still don't understand why you wholesale them. I mean, you're making this much money. Plus you can make the fix and flip side. Like I don't get it. Why? And, and my answer is I literally focus on one thing and that's it. One thing only. I don't, I don't want to focus on six things, two things, three things. If I can focus and be the best at one thing, I don't need the fix and flip. I can do just the wholesale and be just fine. And so he does about 27 fix and flips like rehabs every single year. He said his average is about 25 to 27,000 every mm -hmm. home he does. And so I said, good, take that 27 homes, times it by 27,000, see what you get. And I said, we did about 103 homes last year at an average of about 16,000 seven hundred dollars wow, nice like type type that in and tell me why i don't deal with fix and flip i don't have to worry about contractors i don't have to worry about the guy didn't show up i don't have to worry about high prices low prices or hey i got this crew on this and now i don't have a crew to do this one i said i have zero headaches i'm in and i'm out right yeah it's it's the 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 amount that you're making for the time spent and the effort in it and it's just incredible and you know i think a lot of people find it hard to believe probably that you're making 16 plus on average on wholesales, but it's completely possible in this kind of market. And it um, is. Okay. So the, then the other side of that is, well, you got to find a lot of deals, right? So you've got to find more than the guy that's only doing 27. So I want to hear first though, about when you got started and you like ramped up so quickly and made so much in that first year, how many deals, if you don't mind sharing, was that? And then how did you 
build your marketing machine to be able to get that many deals? Yeah, so right out of the gates, what I started with, and a good rule of thumb, is to, to start getting that phone ringing, because it's a game of numbers, a lot of people think there's a lot more secret to that. So marketing is, 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 is huge, so it's definitely the, the, the three that I love in marketing. It's the right message to the right person at the right time, and yeah. if you can nail that, you've got to get out there and just get consistent and send out mail pieces. And so I started sending out mailers and I had about a $1,200 budget a month when I first got into this, knowing that it was from a mentor that made me uncomfortable. It was like, get uncomfortable. And I'm like, man, this is uncomfortable. Like comfortable to me is like 600. And he's like, good, <laughs> double it. And so nice. I did it, just put faith in it, knowing that he knew what he was doing and his fruits were easily uh, like they're visible he was doing well himself so i was like yeah i can i can do this i know it's uncomfortable my wife's gonna be like what are you doing like you crazy and uh we ended up doing it and i would say it's about day 44 into being in in that uh mentorship program i did my first deal for twenty four thousand dollars, and nice. from there it paid for the coaching it paid for the marketing and it still had plenty of money over to now instead of do twelve hundred dollars the following month i bumped up to three grand and nice. then what i do now is i just put 15 percent back in so whenever a deal closes 15 percent sets aside for marketing and that budget continues to grow to where fast I, forward two years we're about thirty thousand dollars a month we and do i think marketing. that's the thing that any, anybody will find anybody doing a lot of deals if, if all you heard was how much they're spending in marketing, you might freak out and be like, whoa, are you serious? You know, that seems crazy. But but it's all about the return on the investment, you know. And if you, you know, and that's the whole thing. So many people try to get into uh, online marketing using a website or direct mail. And like you said, want to stick to like 600 bucks a month. And it's, it, it's, it's not enough to get enough traction to really make a difference. And I would even say the 1200 isn't really enough to get things going pretty quickly it's a starting point i agree right. with you it is a starting point to like get you uncomfortable but yeah you're gonna have to start getting and, that in there yeah and the more, more yeah and it's scary it, it's super scary and i think that's where people struggle and they they kind of you know even six hundred dollars to a, a lot of people is going to be a big commitment a big risk and get them out of their comfort zone but you've got to understand that you've got to get a hit a lot of people you've got to send out a lot of mail and send it consistently to that same list and uh, and take a lot of calls to get those deals and um and, and the, the lower budget means less calls means less leads means a less likely chance of having the deal and so if you're in below that threshold of of uh, a certain number of leads to get a deal you know you could spend months of throwing this money into what seems like a black hole before getting that deal i mean how many w would you if, are you guys mostly doing direct mail so direct mail is probably 80% of the budget. The rest goes into like pay-per-click, goes into Facebook, goes into door hangers, bandit signs. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of forms of marketing, but a, a good chunk of it is still direct mail. And I, I tell people, like when someone tells you don't direct mail, like get in that yeah. market and start direct mailing because mm -hmm. you're going to be blessed. Yeah, and the so so for a good idea, based on what I was just talking about, do you know your numbers roughly for, for direct mail for how many leads you're getting before you can get a deal? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'll give you an easy breakdown. Look at if you can like reverse engineer this. I'll give you my numbers for Salt Lake. It's going to vary a little bit, but it's going to be pretty close nationwide. And, and I'm seeing this just through uh, people I know as well as students. But uh, with that being said, look at right around a 1% return on your response rate. So if I'm sending out 10,000, I'm going to get, what is that? A hundred phone calls. So I need to send out 10,000 postcards to get a hundred phone calls. Now of that hundred phone calls, let's break that down. 75 of them are going to instantly literally be thrown away. They're going to either call you and tell you to pound sand F off. Like yeah. they'll use verbiage that you're like, man, I hate that. I had to pay money to be told <laughs> that like right. awful. You're going to get, but you do it because it's all about numbers. And I'm telling everyone on this on that's listening today, like if you are not hearing those message, you are not in the right place. You're not sending out enough mail if you are not getting those messages. So when you get it, put a smile on your face and just know, <laughs> man, Cody told me this, Danny told me, I mean, it, I knew this was gonna happen. I'm in the right place and put a smile on your face because you are in the right place you're hearing that. But of 100 phone calls, about 75 are literally gonna be like, take me off your list, remove me, don't do this ever again, you guys are crap whatever like literally they'll break you down so that leaves 25 leads 
So with 10, those 25, male pe- 10,000 male pieces and then 25 leads. Yep. Yeah. 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 So you got to be realistic. That and that's, said, that's what you're looking at, right? Yeah. 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 And uh, with that 25, you're going to have probably, I mean, lowest of one, but I would say two to three that are like, go over to their house and just put it under contract and lock it up. Like easy, easy, easy. Just go over there, talk to them, find a win-win solution, put it under contract. Nice. Uh, some of them could be so easy. Maybe my eight year old, I could say, Hey, just walk up the door and tell them to sign here. And here's the amount of money <laughs> we're doing. And it could be that easy. Then there's probably two that you have to think a little bit outside the box and see the different ways to help them. So it could be that they're going through probate and they still have to go through the attorney, but they can't afford the attorney to do the probate. And so you think outside the box on how to do that structure for them and maybe fund some money up front. But there's things out there. So I'd say for every hundred phone calls, it ends up being about five deals to us. Well, that's actually really good. It's how that looks. Yeah, that's that's and really good. It's because we really think outside the box. So, like I said, typically it's probably going to be one to three that are like really motivated. Anyone could go out and find something to make it work. And then there's two that you just got to think outside the box. Yeah, nice. No, I, I can vouch for those numbers. It lines up pretty well with what we experience with the direct mail as well. So, so when your campaigns, what do you like to to do? Are you a postcard guy, letter guy? You mix it up. Uh, what is? I your- am a. That depends. So I'm a postcard guy. And it again, it all comes down to numbers. I can send out a yellow letter and my response rate is going to be 6%, 7%. It's going to be through the roof, but it doesn't necessarily raise my conversion rate. And I'm looking Same for number. conversion. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't care about response. I want right. what piece is converting. And so with postcards. I have to say that's what drives me nuts when people talk about things like yellow letters. It just drives me nuts when you hear our conversion rate is crazy. I don't care about what your, your response, oh, I'm sorry, response rate, rate. Yeah. your response rate is like through the roof and it's 20%, which is insane. And I don't think it's even realistic for anything, but it's like, you've got right. an incorrect message if you've got that many people calling you back, but it, it doesn't matter. But then and you like, ask that's them, actually how, more how many work. deals did they close? And I'm like, right. Oh, I haven't closed a deal, but my phone's ringing off the hook. I'm like, man, that's a J O B. That's not even <laughs> investing. Yeah. And so that's what it is for us. It's postcards. It's all about numbers. I can get out a postcard for 35 cents. That means I can do probably four or five postcards for the price of one yellow letter. Which one am I going to pick? Yeah. The one that gets five for the price of one. And I'm going to talk about numbers all day long. It's going to be how many people can see my message, how many people can know about what I want to do so that my phone rings so that ultimately I can put homes under contract. Nice. So what, what size of postcard are you guys using? Are you using a local print house or are you guys do, using a national yeah, we, uh, I, you can do local, you can do national. I would say just get on the phone and see who has the best rates and go with them. But I mean, I don't have a postcard on me. I wish I did, but you're looking at like a, just a little simple, like this, a people piece of paper folded up and it happens to be about the size. So, yeah, so what is that? A, a, a yeah. four by eight, I guess it'd be maybe. Yeah. So yeah, it's small. It's just simple. And the message is simple. I think what happens is so many people, people get caught up with what they see in the mail and they look in the mail and they think, oh, let's just match what someone's mailing to us. It's got to be working. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing this. And I can tell you, do not do that. You're crazy. You're going to be throwing a lot of dollars away. Um, There's nothing worse than being marketed to. So you got to make sure your message isn't screaming a marketing piece like the spider that's upside down. You know a pest control company saying, hey, let me spray your yard, right? It's like rip, shred, see you later. Or you got a realtor standing against like the for sale sign. (laughs) You got the cash in the guy's hands and he's smiling and you're like, rip, see you later, right? And so mine has zero pictures. It doesn't have a picture of me. It doesn't have a picture of a home. It doesn't have a picture of money. It is just a message. message. That is it. That way they have to look at it and physically read it to know, is this from the scouts? Is it from the local church? Is it from the community? Is it from the city? Like they don't know because there's no pictures that instantly tell them I'm being marketed to rip so it up, shred it, see what's, you later. What's your headline? Simple. And I would say don't think too deep on this, but keep it simple because you just want a small message that gets your message clear. Like my name's Cody Hoffine. Uh, I'm interested in buying your home at 123 Main Street for a cash offer. Please reach me at – and a phone number. So it's so like what, who simple. you are, who I mean, you are, what you do, so and what, sim- what, what they need to do, call to action. Correct. I mean, it's so simple. Don't overthink it other than keep it simple and then uh, don't put pictures on it. I'm telling you, you your, your response rate will go from 1% to a quarter of a percent. That's interesting to hear. That, that's I hadn't really thought about that. Uh, yeah, it's something I want to test out too because I think we do have some images of some things on there. 
test it. I would love to hear your your feedback when you do it because we test this in literally every state, and and the numbers continue to prove that get that get that pitcher offer, and you'll get less uh, shred rate. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if uh, if the Better Business Bureau logo would would be included in that. Probably no, not. No, no, no. You can put Better Business Bureau because yeah. some people love to see that, right? It's but just like, not the images of like happy of coffee that keeps yeah. warm, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to try that out because we've been looking at changing up our message. And I want to do crazy stuff sometimes, but I, I've seen some where people have paid copywriters and come up with really crazy stuff. And they always say my conversion rate didn't change. Yeah. You know, it's just it, it's more about, like you said, the message, the right person at the right time. And you never know who the right people are exactly. You can get a better, more targeted list. But the right time, you don't know that. So it's it's a matter of mailing people multiple times. How many times do you guys mail the same list? I keep, I, I mean, some people just restrict it from budget. They may do it like every eight weeks and put it on a cycle and maybe do it two, three, four times. I am a guy of like consistent. He who stays consistent wins in this game. And so I don't have a number. My number is infinite. It's just, just keep going. Get my mail piece and put on repeat so that and mine's six weeks. I do a six week cycle. So every time I find a new list or added uh, new people, new names, I just add it to the current list and just put it on repeat every six weeks. So every six weeks, everyone's getting that message. And same exact postcard. Same exact postcard. Yeah. Keep it simple. Keep it yeah. so simple. Cool. And it's a branding thing, right? At some point, they're going to be yeah. like, man, this guy's been mailing me for three years. And I'm finally at the point where I just inherited mom and dad's house. We have no money as siblings to fix it up. It's not even like list worthy because it's in such poor shape. I'm calling Cody because this guy has marketed me for three years. And it's as simple as that. Right. So you're, are you branding your name? Or are you branding your business name or both? You can do both. So we kind of split test that to see what one converts. Because some people want to work with a with a company or a corporation. Some people want to work with an individual. They hate companies. And so, yeah, we'll switch that up a little bit. So okay. it could be Cody Hoffman or Utah Cell Now. And then from there, that's that's really uh, – uh, you're kind of hitting them with, with both of them. So we switch off every now and again okay. just to give them a different feel – to see if it connects with a different uh, mindset of someone that wants to work with the company versus an individual. Yeah, I think that's been the big thing. I think, uh, and it's different for different areas, different cities, and different target markets. Higher end homes versus the lower end homes, stuff like that. But what, what um, and do you include a, the uh, website? I do on your postcards. I do. Yes, I I, I love that because those are the ones that, if someone is ready and they're motivated, they'll call me. But there's also motivated people that are like, oh, I hate talking to people. Like I hate, right. I hate confrontation. I hate talking to people. I hate it. And all of a sudden they look at the website and they fill out my web form. And I'm like, perfect. I love it. So yes, I absolutely do. That way you get uh, multiple personalities uh, to respond to that mail piece because there's people that don't want to talk to us or anyone for that matter. And so uh, they just they have a maybe a shame or I'm behind on my mortgage. Why would I want to talk to uh, Cody about that? That's going to be that's going to be hard. But so they go online like, oh, man, this guy helped this guy that was behind on the mortgage, left a testimonial. OK, so they they work with people like me and then they call me. And that's key. Um, I would never tell anyone that's just starting to go get a website. I think that's a waste of money. I think it's all about no, revenue first. <laughs> see, I'm the guy that's like revenue first. Get the mailings out. Get it no, going. Yeah, I see. When you're yeah. profitable, go get a website. Because at that point, you have a place to post all these amazing – because, again, it's all about a win-win. If it's not a win-win, I don't do business. And so when I make it a win-win – I get a testimonial from every one of my closings where they say, oh, my goodness, we love Utah Cell Now. We love Cody. We love his team. It's been amazing. I put that on my website. Why? So when someone goes in there and says, oh, man, this guy was behind on taxes. Oh, man, this guy got divorced and they helped him out. Oh, man, this guy just inherited mom and dad's house just like us. Like those testimonials yeah. are huge. Yeah, for sure. And, and on, on mail pieces, those, those help out a lot too. So same things that work on direct mail, work on websites, websites, direct mail. Uh, Better Business Bureau, all that kind of stuff. But um, all right, so so direct mail is the majority of where you guys get your leads leads from. And um, let me see. Let, let's go through the process a little bit of your wholesaling, though. Okay. So you you get a call from your marketing. Yep. What's the process? What's the process of talking to them, scheduling appointments, and all that kind of stuff? So we're in the process right now. We're split testing. So we still have fifty percent go to a voicemail. That's just simple. Everything's done where we purchase numbers. I do it through uh, CallRail, for example. 
I purchase a number for every different mail piece. So if you're sending to probate, have a number for all postcards related to probate. If you have a uh, tax delinquent, have a separate number for tax delinquent. That's where you can track data. Like this is so crucial to know your numbers so you know where to invest your money. Um, but essentially we have 50% go to a voicemail. That's simple. That's, hey, thank you for reaching out to us. Um, if you're interested in selling your home, please leave your name, your number, and the address of the property that you're looking to sell. And we'll get back to you just as soon as possible. Because if you get someone to leave all three of those, call them back. They just listened to your voicemail in depth and they did exactly what you asked them to do. So name, number, address. It, some may leave half. Some may not even leave a message. Does that mean not call them back? No. No lead left behind. Like no lead left behind. Get back at it. Just prioritize it. Prioritize the people that left all to the people that left two, to the people left one, to the people left none, and just call the ones that left everything first and work your way down. All right. So, and why is it that you're sending them to voicemail? I mean, is it, um, is it, do you find you get better? Well, I don't know how you get better response. I mean, why not answer all calls? That's a good question. So that's what we've been testing since January and numbers still are improving uh, a better conversion rate if you answer live. Now I will say with that being said, there are a couple deals that you don't know, but I think I have a feeling that I'm leaning towards. There are a couple deals that you'd call like the low hanging fruit that by answering live, it's no different than me and you, right? I want a set of tires for my truck and I'm on lunch break and I have 15 minutes. I can tell you the person that's going to get my business is the first shop that first answers the phone and says, yes, we have those tires in stock. Come on up at four o'clock and we'll put them on. Versus if someone doesn't answer, I'm hanging up and I'm picking up and I'm calling the next one until I get someone live. So there are low hanging fruit that I would say that I probably would have missed out had I not been the live answer. But my, my whole thing is when they call into the voicemail, our team gets back to them in three minutes or less. So we're super quick. It's not like yeah. we're waiting 20, minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, three minutes or less is my criteria because there's still that chance you can get that one that's needs to know right, right now. Right, and those can tend to be the best deals too. So it'd be a shame to miss miss out on those because they're so easy. When somebody's like, "I just want to get rid of this piece of crap," right, and come over right. and take it from me, and 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 yeah, I have fifteen awesome. minutes. I'm on lunch break, and I have to find someone now. Yeah. So when when you're talking to the sellers, do you guys typically go ahead and schedule an appointment and then run your numbers? Yeah, and, and I then think the if it's not a decent deal or you can't don't think you can make a deal out of it, you cancel the appointment or something like that. Yeah, so that's a good question. What we look for is motivation. I think so many people get caught up because we're in the real estate business that they think we're talking about real estate. I can tell you, everyone that's listening, this is so little to do with real estate. It's all to do with people's problems and see if I can be a fit to help them out of their problems. And the byproduct is I'll get a contract that allows me to purchase their home. But I could care less. Yes, I got to ask them like how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, but do I care? I really, really, really don't. What I care about is the why. Why are you selling your house? And so we, we look for strictly 100% just motivation. And the motivation could be inherited mom and dad's house and it's beat up, uh, behind on taxes, behind on mortgage, getting divorced and they have to split up assets, uh, a transfer in the job and they have to move to Arizona and they've got to be gone in two weeks and now the traditional way of listing a home is just not even an option. Um, whatever it is, that's what I'm looking for. And if there's motivation there, I don't even care what price they tell me on the phone. I'll book the appointment based off motivation and then I'll run my numbers on the way of what it is that I need to be at and then we just see if we can make it a win-win when we go to the home. But I always do business face-to-face. -face. I think that's the best way to do it because it gives oh, yeah. the upper hand to actually establish that relationship of trust and let them know I'm a good guy and I'm here to help you out. Yeah, I cringe sort of when I hear people saying that they just email offer contracts without looking at the house. I just, I don't. I don't get it, and it may work from time to time, but I, I, I find it hard to imagine that it would work. Yeah, they're losing uh, 99 a, out of 100 of to me for those people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So do you tell people, since you're going to be uh, you know, looking to market the contract, you're going to sign the contract, what is it that you're telling people? Are you, I mean, do you, you, you know, let people know that, hey, look, we're going to find a buyer? Yeah. Or, I mean, how do, you, how do you go about that with the seller? I think it's simple because I think that's a, a good common question. I like that you brought that up. There's a lot of ways that I do it, and it's right in my contract that this this contract's assignable. Um, but also on top of that, I literally will tell them sometimes I partner with people to uh, to do stuff with on this home. It may not be me that actually purchases the home, but we got you taken care of. As well as 
as simple as, hey, I'm going to be having contractors run by here uh, on Wednesday at four o'clock to do an inspection of the home. Are you okay with that? And yes, they're okay with that. And so yeah. I, I've never had problems with it. I just, I just haven't. And it's, it's because we're up, up front. I think so many people hesitate and hide and there's nothing to hide about. These people, they don't, don't care. You gave them a price. They accept it. They're happy. They don't care what you do with it or how you do with it or what money you make. They just know you made a win-win situation with them and now you're able to, to do what you want. So be forthright with them and upfront with them. There's so many people that do it bad and do it wrong that could add a bad name to just investing in general. I'm just telling you, there's no need for it because people, people are fine with it. They're absolutely fine with it. Yeah, so what do you do when you can't, because this is also the big thing with wholesaling, what do you do if you don't find a buyer for the house, for the contract? Yeah, so those deals that I can't either buy the home myself because now that we went in there, there's a cracked foundation and it's something I didn't see before or my buyer's like, oh, like there's a cracked foundation. I, your numbers are way too tight. What I'll do is I'll literally just go back to cancel the contract. It's all about going over there and just saying, hey, Mrs. Seller, Mr. Seller, I am so sorry. Like I wish I could do this. There's one thing area that came up here, the cracked foundation that makes my numbers skewed on this. At this current price, I'm going to have to cancel this contract. Um, if it's something that you'd reconsider, I'm still here to listen, but we have this currently right now at 120. What is the best you can do? Cause I, right now at 120, I can't do this. I've got to, I've got to cancel this contract and then let them tell you, cause they might tell you, sorry, I've got someone else. And he said he will buy it at 120. Awesome. If I'm not the option, I'm okay with that because if I can just truly go in there and serve them, find the best option, regardless if it's me or not. I know more deals are going to come to me in the future. And so just be upfront and honest with them. And some of them are going to be like, yeah, I can understand that. That crack foundation is going to add a lot of costs. And so I'll just ask them, so what's the best you can do? Well, we can do 105. And if that works, put it right back under contract at 105. Yeah, nice. Yeah, so try to renegotiate it. Don't feel like all is lost. Correct. Try to renegotiate. And hopefully you've got a couple of buyers that already said, hey, I can't do 130, but I can do 120. And then you got to go back and try to get a little bit lower so you get a little bit of room yeah. in there. But. Yeah, and did that sound abrasive? That's the whole point Like I want your listeners right. to listen to. Nothing about that sounded like abrasive, like, sorry, I can't do this. It's a piece of crap home. Like, no, it's how you present it. Just say, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. We came across some things that just make the numbers really, really tough to do, and I apologize. I have to cancel at that price. But is that the best price you can do? And then let them, let them tell yeah. you. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it's awesome. So – uh, let's say you you found a buyer, you, you got the house under contract, good price, you put it out to your list, you got some people interested, you'll look at it and the investor says, hey, I want that. What do you do to put it under contract? So we have an assignable. With, the, with your buyer. Yeah. So we have an assignable agreement, assignable? which allows them to now close on that home. Um, and then we always ask for earnest money. And I have I see people do it where they just collect the earnest money and then I see other people where they have it go to like a title company to be an escrow. And so really what it is, it's the first person to sign that assignable agreement as well as put earnest money down, non-refundable. And the only reason it would be refundable is if we can't provide a clean title. But if it's clean title and they're like, oh, actually, you know what? We don't want any more. They also don't want their earnest money anymore. Right. <laughs> so you got to hold it, right? those cash so buyers accountable. Yeah, yeah. So so what is your, your typical non-refundable earnest money that you request on these? For our market, we do $5,000 earnest money. Oh, nice. And so each That's market, good. I think you got to look at it as how many cash buyers you have, how many deals you come across, like what's the difference? Oh, I'm only going to make 1000 bucks. You probably should only do maybe a $250 earnest money. But yeah, if, you, if you're going to, uh, let's say, make $20,000, you probably should get a, a good piece down. So get that 5,000 earnest well, money. Well, especially like you said, if you've got people, you know, the investors fighting over these and bidding them up and paying more, you want to make sure yep. the person that you choose is going to actually go through with it. And, and $5,000 ought to do it. That is, it is. I, I've had one yeah. person walk away. That, that's it. One person wow. say, this isn't for me. I don't want it anymore. And I'm like, okay, so you're fine losing the earnest money. And he's like, Cody, I'm a man of my word. I know what I signed. I'll lose the 5,000. And then we turned around nice. and sold it again. So, um, it's just staying true to it. And, and they also respect the fact that they know what they're signing as well. Cause I'm very upfront with them in, in a, in a nice way. Like, Hey, so this is earnest money. That's non-refundable. So you're ready to move forward. We're ready to move forward. Perfect. Cause I don't want the conversation. If you back out that, man, I want the money back. I just want to make sure that that's not going to come up. Is that going to come up and ask right. them? Nope. That'll never come up for me, Cody. Perfect. Let's move forward. 
Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have people just signing it and then deciding whether they want to do it or not. You don't have time or want to deal with that and then put the seller of the house, the owner in the house in that position where you get to closing and someone doesn't show up and buy it and they've made decisions based on thinking it was sold. Right. So, yeah, so you, you got to do as much as you can to make sure that it's a, it's a done deal for sure, yeah. Man, this has been really helpful, and um, I'm sure for a lot of people, about wholesaling and covering the typical questions. Is there anything else that you hear from other investors that are considering wholesaling but they have objections to it that you commonly hear? Yeah, you know, I call it the MLM theory, right, the the pyramid theory, right? <laughs> It, it almost sounds too good to be true. And everyone's like, oh, well, it's a great market. And if someone like Cody's hearing about this, it's too late to jump in. I'm telling you right now, let that theory hop right out of your mind. It is a fantastic time to jump in. Would it have been fantastic five years ago? Absolutely. When's the best time to plant a tree? Five years ago. When's the second best time? Today. And so hop in today. There, you're not going to miss out on anything. Yes, what could have been should have been in the past. But guess what? Wholesaling is amazing. Wholesaling is still going strong. It's going to be strong. It's going to continue to go strong. And and the market's awesome. I mean, now is the time to to capitalize on this fantastic market, which is a, a, a seller's market and, a, and, and really – what makes the buyers, your cash buyers, paying you top dollar. I mean, if you learn how to find these deals over and over again, you can do really well with wholesaling. I absolutely love it. It's been a great change to my life to where I've, I've been able to invest into uh, rentals and to where in the last, I'd say last seven, eight months, I've picked up 10 doors and I, I couldn't have done that being an insurance agent. It just, it wasn't there. And so I absolutely love it. Awesome. So for everybody listening out there, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, is there a way that they can reach you? Yeah. Yeah. If they want to learn a little bit more about me and what I do, it's uh, wholesalinginc.com. That's wholesalinginc.com. And I'm always, in fact, something that you could do for your listeners, if they subscribe to that email there, uh, we send out tips, tricks, gold nuggets that they can implement instantly with wholesaling. That's super, super simple. And then also, uh, we'll have to get you on our podcast, but we have a podcast that they can listen to as well, where we interview just our, our students that are out there nationwide doing this exact same thing all over the place, making great money, changing their lives, being the owners of how they want to live their life. And that's what, that I, that's why I love, uh, what we do. It's just, it's, it really is something that you can, you can truly change your life. You truly can, can live the dream life that you want to live and really live it on, on your terms. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll include that in the show notes page as well. So if you weren't able to write it down, it's easy to remember flippingjunkie.com slash 80 for episode 80. So flippingjunkie.com slash 80 and have a link to the website there for Cody and other information, show notes about everything that we covered today. So uh, thank you so much, Cody, and thank you everybody for tuning in. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. All right, and if you're wanting to be able to include that website on your direct mail like Cody does to give a chance to the people that don't really want to call somebody because maybe they don't even know what they're going to say when you pick up the phone um, and want to just head to the website, find out more, and contact you through there, uh, by all means, get one through Lead Propeller. We offer uh, websites for real estate investors based on the over 10, even 12 years of, of experience generating thousands of motivated seller leads online ourselves for our own flipping business all right in Lead Propeller and all the innovations that we currently make get added to Lead Propeller so you can stay on top of everything that's going on online with technology to help you respond to sellers faster to get that edge over your competition. So check it out, leadpropeller.com. And then also, if you haven't yet joined the Flip Pilot Facebook group, I urge you to because it's incredible. It's grown so fast and everybody's helping everybody out. And, uh, you know, if you've got certain questions that you haven't heard answered on the podcast or if you're trying to do some kind of flip and then you've got something that comes up that you're, you're not aware of how to handle, uh, that's what the group's for. You can get in there and ask questions and, and we will help you and other people in the group will help you. There's a lot of experienced investors in the group. Uh, so by all means, join the Flip Pilot Facebook group. You can get an invitation. It is a closed group, but you can get an invitation uh, right away instantly over at FlipPilot.com. FlipPilot.com. So thanks for listening to Flip Junkie Podcast. 